It's live, and as some comrades say, it's lit, right? <laughs> lit, lit, lit. Comrades, and welcome to today's Omali Taught Me Sunday Study live with the leader of the African nation, Chairman Omali Ishitela. This week, we take a pause from the history of anti colonial revolution series and visit the chairman's political report to the party's third, seventh Congress plenary held in February of 2022 that deals with this question of the colonial mode of production. We'll be reading chapter two, starting on page 38 at the subsection white workers and leftists gaily share the feast of colonial loot. You can access the study materials in the social media description. We review this section in light of the escalating attacks being made on our party, movement, and our leadership, Chairman Amalia Shetela, who for the last 60 years of his life has dedicated himself to the freedom of African people and the development of the revolutionary theory known as African internationalism, which has defined the primary contradiction confronting the entire planet as one concentrated in the colonial mode of production. This understanding has been groundbreaking and has led to the world being forever changed. With this understanding, we have challenged any and all opportunists who refuse to acknowledge or struggle against colonialism, who claim to be for socialism and genuine democracy, but refuse to struggle against a parasitic social system that has resulted in life for the colonizer and death and despair to the colonized. We're going to start the study off with the reading by Chairman Amalia Shetela, and following we'll break four announcements and return with a question and answer period. Before we start, make sure to share this video far and wide. Take a moment right now to like this video, tag your friends, subscribe to our YouTube and Chairman Amalia's Twitch channel. This government wants to silence our community, our leadership and our ideas but you can push back by sharing this study. Now, it's my honor to introduce the leader of the African nation and the worldwide African revolution, Chairman Amalia Shetela. Uhuru Chairman. Uhuru. Uhuru. Thank you very much, Comrade Director Akile. Um, I want to uh, express my appreciation to you uh, for the introduction and for everyone else who has come on to this discussion. It is an extremely important discussion and we want to invite everybody uh, to actually look at and study the entire document that we'll be uh, excerpting from right now. And I just want to remind everybody that the party the African People's Socialist Party, and I have always uh, sought uh, to contribute to uh, a materialist examination of history, understanding of history, a dialectical and historical materialist uh, 
uh, viewpoint to bring introduce science uh, into the revolutionary project that we are involved in to minimize or uh, reduce the, the influence of uh, a subjective interpretation of history uh, and uh, the development of, uh, of uh, human society, of society itself. And so it's, you should keep that in mind. And again, uh, I'm calling on everybody to study this, uh, look at it, and, and, and all of the party members and members of the Huda movements and all friends and everyone who's interested in, in coming up to uh, a conclusion, a better conclusion about what is happening in the world uh, today and its origin, its, uh, its inception, where it comes from. Uh, I invite you to look at this and doing so uh, not only will help, I believe, uh, everyone to understand uh, the, the nature of the societies that we live in and where we contend and fight uh, for our lives and the lives of, the, of our people and the future, uh, but I think it also helps to uh, eliminate uh, any suspicions or assumptions that uh, uh, our worldview uh, has, is something that was recently born. We go through this whole process of how we came to this conclusion, and we also hope that this will help everyone to uh, be reinforced in, in, in understanding uh, that the, the practice, the political goals, the political activities that we're involved in, our tactics and strategies and things like that, uh, stem from uh, an actual scientific examination uh, of, 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 hum of society itself and our place and role in that society. So I'm going to move forward now, as you just mentioned, uh, starting uh, on page 38 of this uh, political report to our plenary <clears throat> that occurred in February of 2022. And uh, the subhead here is white workers and leftists gaily share the feast of colonial loot. <clears throat> as long ago as, as 1858 in a letter to Karl Marx, his comrade and collaborator Frederick Engels offered this materialist observation about the ability of white people to unite with their ruling class in the exploitation of the colonial world, and quote from Engels, for a nation which exploits the whole world, this is of course, to a certain extent, justifiable. Later in 1882, in a, le in a letter uh, on the same subject, Engels commented uh, to Karl Kowski, quote, you ask me what the English workers think about colonial policy. Well, exactly the same as they think about politics in general. The workers gaily share the feast of England's monopoly <coughs> of the world market and the colonies, unquote. In Easyway Late to E Africa, we provide evidence that the unacknowledged colonial mode of production plays a major role in the consciousness of the most advanced sector of the white colonial population. It shows the basis for the perennial white opportunism and betrayal in favor of maintaining the place of white people on the pedestal of African exploitation and colonizers. We state in this political report, uh, Uneasy Equilibrium, quote, while today white left nationalist opportunism, again, while today white left nationalism opportunism has been forced to acquire a sophisticated articulation of its unity with maintaining the oppression of Africans, the pedestal which white capitalist power requires for its existence, there was a time when it made no attempt to hide its colonialist, which is to say imperialist worldview. At the 1907 Congress of the Second Communist International, held in Stuttgart, Germany, which was attended by more than 800 delegates, the majority resolution declared that under a socialist regime, regime colonization would be a force for civilization. Let me read that again. At the 1907 Congress of the Second Communist International held in Stuttgart, Germany, which was attended by more than 800 delegates, the majority res resolution declared that under a socialist regime, colonization could be a force for civilization. While many white communists have attributed the reactionary stance of white people, including the white working class, to their being confused or duped by the white bourgeoisie, these excerpts from arguments by prominent communists at the Cong Congress reveal that these advanced representatives of the white working class were quite clear in their colonialist motivation and that in their view, 
the benefit of colonialism to the white world did not require the existence of the bourgeoisie. In other words, capitalism, as they understood it, could be gone. The following also found in Israel to e Africa are excerpts of arguments by supporters of the majority position at the Second Communist International against Stuttgart, 1907. They include statements by Hendrik van Kohl from the Netherlands and Edward Bernstein from Germany. And here's Hendrik van Kohl from the Netherlands in his presentation at that Congress. He says, the minority resolution also denies that the productive forces of the colonists can be developed through the capitalist colonial policy. I do not understand at all how a thinking person can say that. Simply consider the colonization of the United States of North America. Without it, the native peoples there would today be living in the most backward social conditions. Does Letterbourg want to take away the raw materials indispensable for modern society which the colonists can offer? Does he want to give up the vast resources of the colonies, even if only for the present? Do those German, French, and Polish delegates who signed the minority resolution want to accept the responsibility for simply abolishing the present colonial system? As long as humanity has existed, there have been colonies. And I think that they will exist for a long time yet. Surely there are few socialists who think that colonies will be unnecessary in the future social order. Although we do not need to discuss this question today, I still ask Ledebour, does he have the courage now under capitalism to give up the colonies? Perhaps he can tell us what he would do about the overpopulation of Europe. Where would the people who must immigrate go if not to the colonies? What does Ledebour want to do with the growing production of European industry if he does not want to create new export markets in the colonies? And does he, as a social democrat, want to shirk his duty to work continually for the education and further advancement of the backward peoples? Especially for Germany's sake, I regret that the social democracy there has limited itself to questioning the need for colonies and the benefits they bring. You saw in the last election campaign how the masses were hypnotized by the thought of the benefits to be gained from the colonies, not only the petty bourgeoisie, but also the industrial workers. And here's Bernstein from Germany. He says, we must get away from the utopian notion of simply abandoning the colonies. The ultimate consequence of such a view would be to give the United States back to the Indians. The colonies are there. We must come to terms with that. Socialists too should acknowledge the need for civilized peoples to act somewhat like guardians of the uncivilized. LaSalle and Marx recognize this. In the third volume of Capital, Marx wrote, quote, the earth does not belong to one people, but to all of humanity. Every people must administer it for the good of humanity. And LaSalle once said, the right of a people to its own development is as little an absolute right as any you will find. It is tied to the condition that there is some development. But peoples do not develop, but peoples who do not develop may justifiably be subjugated by peoples who, who have achieved civilization. Our economies are based in large measure on the extraction from the colonies of products that the native people had no idea how to use. Then here's Van Kohl. He makes a statement. There's this debate, this discussion going on about whether or not colonialism should exist under socialism. And here's what Van Kohl says. He supports this position, that it should. Uh, colonialism must exist under, under socialism. He says, various comrades have said that there is no way to improve the colonial economies. This is false and contradicts the history of colonial policy. Through our socialist activity in the Dutch parliament, we have achieved significant advantage for our colonies. Why should we help only the workers of Europe and not those of other parts of the earth. Arrayed against us in Europe are the mighty forces of capitalism. Why should we not also take up the struggle against capitalism in other continents? Nowhere else could we achieve easier and bigger victories than there. I might remind people that it was the Dutch uh, who uh, brought the first uh, captives uh, from Africa to the United States in 1619. Uh, uh, Lillibor said the majority of efforts, uh, the majority's efforts are reactionary. I simply do not understand how he, as a man of science, can fail to recognize that the colonists must first pass through a stage of capitalist development 
before you can begin to think of socialism there. So we are working for the revolutionary development of the colonies in order to facilitate the transformation of the feudal state into unto a modern one through capitalism to socialism. A leap from barbarism to socialism is impossible. To deny this is not only unscientific, but stupid and short-sighted. Why in God's name should we not be able to raise constructive demands for this development just as we do for the questions of militarism and tax laws? Kowski maintains the thesis that colonial policy is conquest, is imperialism. This formula is completely wrong. You should learn better grammar. Today, to be sure, colonial policy is imperialist, but it does not have to be. It can be democratic as well. In any case, it is a grave error of Kowski to put colonial policy conceptually on a par with imperialism. I hope that he, see, he will see uh, that this is unjustified and that he will strive to make good the error. And this is something really interesting to see that in 1907, uh, the communists were making the same argument uh, about uh, uh, this whole question of democratic uh, colonialism. And that's what we are saying. Colonialism is colonialism, whether it's democratic or whether it's fascist. Uh, the fact is that under colonial domination, uh, our people suffer. And we suffer where, whether the colonizer is called a fascist or whether the colon, colonizer is called democratic and what have you. Colonialism uh, is the factor that Africans and colonized people have to contend with. And so democratic uh, uh, colonialism, as being argued here, uh, doesn't satisfy the requirements uh, for progress and for freedom that African people need. And so here, Kowski said that we must, I'm, I'm finishing uh, now, continuing the discussion uh, that's, that's uh, being put forth in our, uh, uh, from Van Kohl. Uh, he said, Kowski uh, said that we must win the confidence of the native peoples. How does he hope to win the confidence of millions of people of other skin colors if he does nothing for them? We in Holland have the duty and the right to tell the comrades of other countries about our experience. We Dutch socialists have gained the confidence of millions of Javanese, but in Africa, the people know nothing about the German social democracy because until now it has not done its duty. If you want to win the confidence of the native peoples, then you must actively engage yourself in the colonial question. The learned Kowski made matters even worse with his advice on how to develop the colonies industrially. We're supposed to take the machines and tools to Africa, a theoretical pipe dream that's supposed to civilize the country. Suppose that we bring a machine to the savages of Central Africa. What will they do with it? Perhaps they will start up a war dance around it. And he says this to laughter or perhaps by, uh, by one, the number of their innumerable, or, or, or increased rather by one, the number of their innumerable holy idols, uh, laughter again. Perhaps we should send some Europeans to run the machines. What the native peoples would do to them, I do not know, but perhaps Kowski and I will make the attempt. Perhaps theory and practice will then go hand uh, in hand into that savage land with the tools and machines. Perhaps. The natives will destroy our machines. Perhaps they will kill us or even eat us. And then I fear, and he's rubbing his belly head, says, says this, given our superior corporal, my superior corporal development, I would have precedence over Kowski. Uh, if we Europeans go there with tools and machines, we will be defenseless victims of the natives. Therefore, we must go there with weapons in hand, even if Kowski calls that imperialism. And he says there's still great support from the people who are in this, in this uh, meeting uh, in that hallway. As we said, there's 800 people in, in the hallway, but there was something like 60,000 people who attended the rallies uh, in Stuttgart uh, 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 outside of the formal delegates in hallway. So we say white communists must sub commit uh, to struggle against colonialism under the leadership of the colonized. As we all summed up from Israel, as we also summed up from Israel to e Africa about these very explicit and telling quotes from the most prominent white colonizer, leftist, and socialist of a century ago. Quote, African internationalism will not allow our party to construct some fanciful notion of reality upon which to base the policies of our party. We are materialists, and we based our policies on the world as it actually is, rather than basing our policies on the world as we would like it to be. Those who ignore the real world and base their policies on the notions in their heads, on, on the world as they would like it to be, are idealists. The fact is that capitalism was born as parasitic white power. 
and it must be defeated as parasitic white power. Genuine communists of all nationalities must be consciously committed to the overthrow of white power, and white communists must be committed to the overthrow, uh, must be committed to the struggle for the victory of black power over white power. The beginning of the process for white communists in the U.S. and the world uh, to abandon the interests of imperialism and to integrate their own interests with the interests of the toiling masses of the world is to subordinate their interests to the struggle of the oppressed peoples of the world, to overthrow parasitic white power. In the U.S., this can only be done through joining the anti-colonial struggle for black power. Concretely, this means joining the African People's Solidarity Committee, an organization of and subordinate to the African People's Socialist Party, the advanced attachment of the revolutionary African working class and poor peasantry, unquote. In this political report to the Party Historic Congress more than 30 years ago, we stated that the profound opportunism of white people manifests itself as extreme violence and near total self-alienation of white people from the vast majority of the world's peoples. This alienation is expressed in many ways, but none uh, so significant as the inhumane, barbaric treatment white people have participated in and or encouraged against other peoples, often with the only provocation being the desire of whites to take or keep possession of ill-gotten resources which have become essential to the white way of life, unquote. We were able to conclude that the formation of the African People's Solidarity Committee and its ideological and structural relationship to the party were grounded in a firm theoretical basis because of our understanding of colonialism as a mode of production. By the time of our party's sixth Congress in 2013, our theory had developed to the point that we celebrated its meaning as a tool for recapturing the brains of the colonized and for setting world history on a correct course. In my political report to that Congress, I was able to write, and I quote, our African internationalist theoretical contributions serve to break the shackles historically imposed on revolutionary theory as perceived through the lens of oppressor nation intellectuals, colonizers, whose worldview was determined by their existence on the pedestal of our oppression. African internationalism for the first time allows for Africans and the oppressed of the world to become the subjects of history, defining our own destiny, something not possible with the theory of Marx or his contemporaries and followers, unquote. Marx and Marx has developed the term mode of production, which according to Marx includes, uh, quote, everything that goes into the production of the necessities of life, including the productive forces, labor, instruments, and raw materials, and the relations of production, the social structures that regulate the relations between humans in the production of goods. According to Marx and Engels, for individuals, the mode of production is a definite form of expressing their life, a definite mode of life on their part. As individuals express their life, so they are. Why, what they are therefore coincides with their production, both with what they produce and how they produce. Uh, and it's really important to say this. I mean, talk about what they produce and how they produce. We take us to a different place from how this has traditionally been understood coming uh, from uh, a, a rather self-centered uh, uh, analysis uh, and uh, understanding uh, by European colonizers. Uh, because uh, what has happened now is that the production process not is not restricted to some small uh, European city-state or to what is now characterized as Europe at, at, uh, 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 at all, it is now uh, related to uh, the relationship that Europe, uh, what we call Europe has uh, with the rest of the peoples of the world. The, the whole nature and the definition of society has changed. Uh, and this is something that they have not been able to understood. In, in fact, what they understood uh, Africa and other peoples uh, are uh, as uh, some kind of uh, bridge between uh, the, the, the savagery of, uh, uh, between uh, European feudalism uh, and the development of white society that we call capitalism. This bridge, they characterize as primitive accumulation of capital. And, uh, and, and we recognize, of course, is itself the so-called bridge 
uh, is actually a mode of production that we characterize as a colonial mode of production. So it is a combination of the defining, uh, it is a combination of defining relations and forces of production at play within a society. Uh, let me go back here. We say that, uh, uh, again, uh, according to Marx and Engels, for individuals, the mode of production is a definite form of expressing their life, a definite mode of life on their part. As individuals express their life, so they are. What they are, therefore, coincides with their production, both with what they produce and how they produce. Uh, it is a combination of the defining relations and forces of production at play within a society. From their viewpoint, as European colonizers sitting on the pedestal of African oppression, Marx and Engels erroneously define various modes of production throughout human history as universal stages of development, supposedly taking all human society from lower level levels to higher stages. Marx and Engels define these stages as going from primitive communism to slavery to feudalism to capitalism, which they see as progressive development over feudalism, and eventually full-blown communism, apparently given legitimacy by the fact that it has been achieved by Europe, functioning as the template for so-called human development. However, with this formula, the movement from European feudalism to world capitalism continued to be a mystery despite the effort by Marx to resolve this with his definition of primitive accumulation, the turning of Africa into a warrant for the commercial hunting of black skins that signalized the rosy dawn of capitalist production, unquote. Marx said more than about this, but it all boils down to the fact that it was colonialism that, quote unquote, developed and impoverished, disease-ridden Europe out of feudalism and that the feudal mode of production with its specific features was replaced by the colonial mode of production with specific features revolving around the parasitic extraction of value of human and material resources from the colonized to European colonizers. So in January 1990, uh, a, a January 1990 presentation I made to a conference sponsored by a party in St. Petersburg, Florida, uh, represented uh, another occasion where the question and theoretical implication of colonialism as a global phenomena was uh, addressed by uh, to a mass audience of African people. In addition to Africans from throughout the United States and some members of the American Indian movement, uh, participants included represent representatives from uh, movements from Guyana, South America, uh, the Gambia, West Africa, and Azania, commonly known as South Africa. The conference was titled uh, Freedom Weekend and was designed to address the issue of a heightened counterinsurgency war being made against our movement. And here's an excerpt from that presentation that I made then, <coughs> uh, excuse me, <coughs> uh, that I made then in 1990. Uh, quote, in explaining the emergence of capitalism in human history, uh, Marx defined the relationships that people got uh, who got paid for the labor hat with the bourgeoisie as wage slavery. He said that wage slavery in Europe needed as a precondition slavery pure and simple in the new world. To us, that meant clearly that the fundamental contradiction in the world is not the contradiction that occurred between white workers and their bosses. Rather, it was the contradiction that existed between slavery pure and simple, the pedestal, and wage slavery or the capitalist production, all the capitalist relationships that rested on this pedestal of slavery. We have said all along that the class question is concentrated in the colonial question. That is the only explanation why European revolution has never happened. Uh, even the existence of what they call the Soviet Union had to be ex explained by Lenin in retrospect. Before the Russian Revolution, all the comrades throughout Europe, all the communists throughout Europe, and even the Bolsheviks had said that socialist revolution would happen in Western Europe first. They believed that the revolution in Europe was to get rid of the czar, to overthrow feudalism. Since according to their theory, feudalism led to capitalism, it would have to be a revolution ushering in capitalism. Even after the February Revolution in 1917, most of the Bolsheviks refused to try to make a socialist revolution because it defied everything they said was supposed to happen. What then is the historical base for the basis for the rise of socialism? The historical basis for the rise of socialism is the destruction of the pedestal upon which the whole capitalist edifice rests. The historical basis for the rise of socialism 
is a revolutionary activity throughout Africa and among the African communities in the U.S., throughout Asia and Latin America. This ongoing process becoming deeper with every go around uh, is what has been consistently undermining capitalism and imperialism and therefore bringing us closer to a period where socialist revolution on a world scale is finally a real possibility, unquote. So African people produce, reproduce real life for white people. My book, An Uneasy Equilibrium, the political report to the party's sixth Congress, was one of our most definitive statements providing the basis for my conclusion that colonialism was the mode of production moving Europe out of feudal destitution and despair. This same process created the conditions for the development of both the European bourgeoisie and working class from the same fabric that gave rise to the fundamental unity of opposites of the colonizers and colonized that constitutes a mode of production. I stated, quote, our party and movement were forced to conclude that all humans, including Europeans, are trapped by an absolute necessity to secure and develop a means of subsistence. In other words, the primary motivating factor, motivating factor in human society is the production and reproduction of life. Without life, all other questions, religion, culture, genetics, etc., cetera, are moot, meaningless. Indeed, culture is a byproduct of the process of producing and reproducing life. However, the process of Africans producing and reproducing life was drastically disrupted and altered by the European attack that resulted in the capture and colonial enslavement of African Africans. This attack by Europeans on Africa also resulted in the imposition of artificial borders that separate the dispersed African nation from our human and material resources and from a meaningful relationship among ourselves and with the peoples of the world. The material and human resources of Africa have gone to satisfy the requirements of life for Europeans at the expense of Africa and Africans. The process of Africans producing and reproducing life has not been primarily for African Africans, it has been primarily for Europe and the white world at our expense. This progenitor of world capitalism, the attack on Africa and Africans, along with the European assault on Asia and the Americas, rescued Europe and Europeans from an oppressive thousand year long disease ridden impoverished is existence known as feudalism. This was the genesis of the capitalist system as a world economy created on a base of the enslavement of Africans and others. A scientific uh, analysis of human society requires that we take a dialectical approach. We cannot see the world as a as static and ready-made. Society has to be analyzed as a process that is in a constant state of motion, change, and development. There is always something new arising to replace the old. And all social motion occurs in relationship to this process of coming into existence and dying away. Europe's attack on Africa was effectively an assault on Africa's ability to produce life for itself. This assault has, led the, has had the effect of pushing Africa and Africans out of history. Slavery, genocide, and colonialism are the stuff of which capitalism was born. African enslavement was the first capital in the development of capitalism. The prevailing legal system, culture, religion, and general philosophical outlook or worldview constitute the superstructure of capitalism thus conceived. This superstructure is a natural product and reflection of this economic base of colonial slavery. Slavery and colonialism gave rise not only to capitalism, but also to the capitalists and working classes alike of Europe and North America, the workers and the bourgeoisie, the two primary capitalist defining classes have occasionally fought great battles with each other since their inception as contending social forces. Nevertheless, both were born and developed on a platform of slavery and colonialism. Consequently, what is often called class struggle inside the United States and Europe is actually contention among the workers and the ruling class for control of the parasitic capitalist pedestal and its stolen resources. And you go back to the Stuttgart uh, conference, uh, Communist International Conference in 1907, and that's what you hear. You hear this contest, this, this contention among uh, the representatives uh, of the working class and the ruling class for control of the parasitic capitalist pedestal and its stolen resources. And you also saw that on January 6th 
uh, when the white workers and other people attack uh, the U.S. Capitol, there's contention between sectors and in, in, in some instances of the bourgeoisie uh, who bring with, uh, with them uh, sectors of the working class and other classes in, the, in, in contest with, uh, with uh, another sector of the bourgeoisie, etc. So the parasitic foundation of world capitalism continues to exist up to now as a true economic base upon which the entire superstructure of the capitalist-defined, capitalist-dominated world rests. The total existence of so-called white people and their ability to produce and reproduce life is dependent on this parasitic relationship that came into being with the attack by feudal Europe on Africa and the world. Instead of separate, more or less self-contained worlds existing in casual relationship to each other, there is one capitalist world system united by a parasitic economic relationship imposed by Europe upon the rest of us. There is therefore no European reality separate from that of Africa and the rest of the world. The entire world is now locked into a single dialectical process, a unity of opposites, whereupon the gruesome extraction of life and resources from Africa and the rest of the world is a condition for the life and development of what we now know as Europe, white people, and the capitalist system to which we have been forcibly affixed. The legal system, culture, the white sense of sameness and political institutions are a reflection of this parasitic economic base. Every white aspiration and dream, every expectation for happiness and a good life from a successful marriage to a secure future for their children requires drone strikes in Pakistan, police murders and mass imprisonment in the African colonies and barrios of the United States and starvation and forced displacement of the oppressed throughout the world, unquote. So we say, comrades, uh, this is a mode of production that rescued Europe at our expense and is generally defined as human progress when viewed through the lenses of European intellectuals, including the Marxist colonials who love us. Bourgeois class informed confusion around, this, around the fact uh, that uh, colonialism is the mode of production has been a primary contributor uh, to the stalemate faced by revolutionaries up to this date. Lack of clarity on this crucial point led to the erroneous conclusion that so-called success in the struggle within a single country can possibly bring socialism or communism into existence. Only African internationalism explains the existing social system as a product of colonialism. It is a system that requires colonialism as a pedestal and that cannot exist without colonialism. It constitutes a colonial mode of production enveloping the world. As all the political movements, communism, fascism, etc., occur within this colonial mode of production, only African internationalism targets the global colonial mode of production and not just some expression of exploitation and oppression that it produces. This is a fundamental philosophical contradiction that has bedeviled revolutionary theoreticians since the nominal end of colonialism. It is something that has and always will distinguish the party's trajectory from other organizations. Essentially, the fact is that most of the world sees national liberation resulting as entry into the existing international order. This is due to not recognizing the colonial mode of production as the existing international order. Recognition of the colonial mode of production forces us to struggle to defeat the existing international order, not to integrate into it. This philosophy, of integration is in analogous to the political, to the politics of liberal groups, colonized and colonizer, acknowledged liberals. Uh, uh, let me say this philosophy of integration is analogous to the, to the politics of liberal groups, colonized and colonizer, acknowledged liberals and those posing as communists incorrectly requiring Africans and other colonial subjects to fight for integration into the system as the way to overturning capitalism and African oppression. The anti-colonial movement came into existence as part of the existing international order, born of the colonial mode of production. Consequently, its general understanding of the world is influenced by this economic base and its superstructure stemming from the colonial mode of production. Moreover, the colonial mode of production serves the interests of the global colonialist ruling class, defined by the superstructure 
that brought into existence, including the idea institutions that formulate them. Let me read this again. Moreover, the colonial mode of production serves the interests of the global colonialist ruling class defined by the superstructure that brought it into existence, including the ideas and institutions that formulate them. Such a ruling class is not about to define itself out of existence. One reason the colonizer has not been able to recognize his significance as stemming from colonialism. Hence, the world has been trapped on an ideological and political treadmill like the Gerbil running wheel. Regardless of the speed and intensity of the motion, we never get to our desired destination. Only African internationalism will get us there. So uh, comrade uh, director, uh, I went through that rather quickly, um, uh, uh, but I'm open now to uh, however uh, you see us uh, needing to move uh, from this point. And I'm hoping that if people have questions and things like that or want to involve uh, yourselves in this discussion that uh, from time to time you may f uh, want to reference you know, pages and, and what have you uh, that we are reading from. Uhuru, Director Akile. Uhuru, Chairman. Um, well, we do have some time now if you wanted to just you know, go over um, anything else. Otherwise, we could move to um, our announcements and then Q&A. So um, we, have, we have some time here. Um, well, I, I just think that one of the most important things that uh, with the defeat, defeat of the Black Revolution of the 1960s, uh, that we were talking about more than just the, um, uh, the, the physical uh, destruction uh, uh, or the uh, immobilizing uh, incarcerating, incarceration of uh, people who participated in leading uh, that, that movement of the 1960s, the assassinations and things like that. In fact, there are people who are still in prison uh, in this country, and that's to say the United States, uh, who were involved uh, in, this, in this movement. So the defeat uh, meant more than just the physical destruction. Uh, it also was an assault on the ideas. Uh, which is uh, real critical because with the defeat of the revolutionary forces, with the defeat of Malcolm X, who was very clear uh, and, and incipient uh, African internationalist in defining the world that we lived in, with the defeat, uh, with <clears throat> even before that, but preceding that, the uh, attack on Marcus Garvey, and then subsequent to that, as I mentioned, uh, uh, Malcolm X and even King, uh, Martin Luther King, <clears throat> with the uh, assassinations of people like Patrice Lumumba, uh, with the uh, wounding and murder of Che Guevara, uh, with the overthrow of Kwame Nkrumah, this was an assault not just on living human beings and not just on the organizations, but on the ideas that were born uh, from our struggle that came closest to a, 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 a real analysis of uh, an understanding of the conditions of existence. So this were you saw this whole destruct, this whole discussion that was emerging around colonialism, how it looked, and people like Cabral and Malcolm and and others <coughs> made uh, uh, and Nkrumah uh, made uh, important contributions to that. But uh, this is at the height of uh, the uh, the also the uh, ideological the uh, the pinnacle of uh, of intellectual. Uh, uh, discourse and development of the African Revolution, and so when they crushed that, uh, they also uh, was making they were making an assault. That is to say, the co colonizers. Uh, it constituted a major assault on the ideas uh, and and their development. So uh, the the defeat of the African Re military defeat of the African Revolution of the 1960s uh, 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 put, uh, contributed to. Uh, a real assault uh, on the development of revolutionary ideas. Now, what we have is that the African People's Socialist Party, uh, which as a formation came into existence in the 1972, but riding off the wave and participating with the members of the party and myself uh, from the whole Black Revolution of the 1960s. Uh, and we, we found our responsibilities completing that revolution and not Assuming that uh, that who we were and where we were was uh, something uh, you know that was born anew, but there was a that we the dialectics, the whole process of the development of our movement, we were able to recognize that, and uh, even as we saw some critically significant forces coming into being that did not necessarily understand uh, the origin of their own motion, uh, 
you know, uh, we remember Marx's, uh, 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 you know, statement about how you cannot judge a movement by its own consciousness that, that any more than you can judge an individual about what that individual thinks of himself, that uh, there needs to be a, a, an ability to understand what gives rise to uh, political movements. And so uh, if you don't do that, uh, then you find yourself in this place where you walk into uh, uh, history, uh, an understanding of history based on how that understanding is being articulated by people who are even new uh, to the process, who do not have access to history. Like I can go to my shelves and my uh, on my bookshelves, I find works that are written, you know, uh, hundred a couple of hundred years ago, written by people who uh, 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 claim to be, uh, you know, revolutionary revolutionary philosophers and things like this. Uh, and 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 their ideas continue to exist. They're bound up in volumes uh, on the one hand, but the other hand, you cannot find that kind of work uh, by African revolutionaries and African revolutionary thinkers and what have you, um, because they have been wiped out, destroyed. And so uh, most of us uh, have had to rely on the interpretations and understanding of uh, coming from uh, the colonizers. And I'm not just talking about, quote unquote, evil colonizers. I'm talking about even the colonizers who loved us, if you will, uh, to coin a phrase. Uh, uh, and so the party uh, started off recognizing that uh, we had to solve these problems. And we had real struggles because of the lack of uh, ideological development that, uh, that our movement uh, uh, um, expressed uh, at, at this time. And we worked really hard to try to solve that problem, to, uh, to deepen uh, 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 theoretical uh, understanding, to uh, take uh, the philosophy of uh, given birth by uh, the process of African people struggling to, uh, uh, to utilize the uh, scientific methods of uh, of uh, dialectical and historical materialist investigation and analysis to uh, and apply it to that reality. And from that, we were coming up with the philosophy of African internationalism that uh, to, uh, contributed a scientific explanation. So it's not, it's not just uh, how we interpret the world based on how we feel, uh, based on the fact that white people don't like us, we don't like white people, that kind of thing. That doesn't inform us at all. Uh, based on the notion that uh, there's a biological basis for uh, the differences that we, uh, uh, of opinion, the difference of how we see the world, you know, uh, the, based on uh, the assumption that, uh, that uh, the white man is uh, uh, some genetic uh, mutation that receives and understands the world a particular way because of that, or based on some other kind of subjective thing about religion and what religion you have. And I've seen Africans who have concluded that the reason that we uh, are oppressed is because we've adopted the white man's religion and that we have to get rid of the white man's religion and we have to go back to our own religion. And the fact of the matter, of course, is that religion itself uh, is a form of, uh, of idealism and that uh, uh, the, the significance of, of the religion as a, as a factor in undermining our struggle and our will to fight, et cetera, was, was it was an assault on the belief system uh, that united African people in a certain way uh, and the replacement of that belief system with the belief system of our oppressor. But the belief system of our oppressor did not, was not limited to, to Christianity. Uh, it it uh, also uh, uh, was a belief system that uh, came into existence through a particular uh, mode of production, a particular way that uh, this, this new world, and I say new world, that came into existence through colonialism, uh, through slavery, uh, and how this new world uh, was a united world for the first time in history, a world that was united uh, 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 economically. One single economy united the whole world. It wasn't, uh, there was no longer this, this little patchwork of these warring tribes in Europe, uh, backwards and poor and starving and disease written, et cetera. Uh, but the starvation and poverty and disease chased them uh, out of Europe looking for other means of, uh, of development, capturing resources. And they weren't looking for development in the sense that let's go out and create a new world. They were trying to eat. 
they were following, looking for the goal of uh, that Mansa Musa uh, 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 had uh, had uh, uh, distributed, had 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 uh, brought into their consciousness uh, through uh, this uh, in in something like 1328, um, uh, going some six thousand miles from Ali into Egypt and distributing gold and building mosques and things like that along the way. They wanted to find that gold because they were starving so much so. Uh, that in England in the in the 1300s uh, we had a situation where poverty was so great, the economy was so bad uh, that uh, people uh, were actually eating the cats and dogs and, and and bird fecal matter and their children, and this was the poverty that they were trying to uh, get away from, and they found their way out of it uh, not because of some great plot, some conspiracy that they developed, but they found their way out of it by Portugal. Uh, uh, they're looking for that gold. And they, uh, uh, all of them had to find this goal to try to cure the economic uh, uh, conditions that they were faced with. And they were looking at as individual uh, uh, city-states and things like that in Europe, feudal uh, fiefdoms. Uh, and what consolidated them uh, into a single uh, 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 self-defining uh, group, a uh, sense of, of sameness, uh, uh, was the uh, emergence uh, uh, the, the, of this world economy uh, that united, that brought resources to them, that helped them to see themselves as a group as opposed to these uh, these uh, individual fiefdoms uh, and and warring tribes. And now uh, they have a sense of sameness, but that sense of sameness was based on uh, the fact that uh, collectively. Uh, they were developing as a consequence of what they were taking from Africa and first Africa and then throughout the what we now refer to as the Americas and much of the much of the rest of the world. This is the emergence of a social uh, system, but this was a colonial mode of production. But the thing that gave birth even to the consciousness of what we now call the white man or to Europe and Europeans, the birth of, of the white man, birth of Europe, uh, uh, the thing that consolidated it uh, all together uh, was this unity that was achieved, uh, uh, this self-serving uh, unity that was achieved as a consequence of this uh, assault that, they was, that was being made on the rest of the world and the wealth that came with that. Uh, and here's where you have uh, the birth of the consciousness, uh, the birth of the so-called American. So how can you be an American? Uh, uh, how does it become conscious of itself as one group except at the expense of the indigenous people where you have uh, these people who uh, are Europeans coming from various places around uh, throughout Europe and taking this land and, 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 and imprisoning uh, the population here. They come from throughout Europe uh, in this assault on Africa and taking African people and dispersing us around the world. This is the emergence of the economy that we are talking about. This is why we say it's a colonial mode of production and that uh, the party, the African People's Socialist Party, and I have played. Uh, this role in, in struggling against how all of this is understood and, and, and bringing science into this discussion uh, so that, and we do not accept this notion that somehow African people do not have agency, uh, that it took uh, Europe, we are some kind of appendage of uh, a footnote to the history of the development of Europe, which is even what Marxism takes us with this assumption of primitive accumulation of capital. Uh, we are the origin of this thing, even though it did not come voluntarily on our part at this at the time uh, we met Europe, which was starving, which was unfree, et cetera, living under feudal domination. Uh, and it was through uh, this process of capturing black people, taking the lands and resources of, of the oppressed peoples around the world. In fact, this is part of what's disintegrating right now, the great chaos that we see occurring in the world that's given, that's wreaking havoc uh, with uh, what might be otherwise characterized as European civilization, whether that's in America, England, France, and the rest of that, uh, is that uh, increasingly it's difficult for them to hold on uh, to these resources because peoples everywhere are taking back their resources. And that's why uh, freedom for Africa uh, and freedom for uh, the indigenous peoples uh, uh, is somehow uh, challenges the existence of, the, uh, of this this uh, oppressive and exploitative so, uh, social system and even uh, a whole uh, group uh, that identifies itself as a people uh, and achieve that identity as a consequence of enslaving the rest of us. Our, our break from this uh, slavery uh, even challenges the self-definition and ability of the colonizers to define themselves uh, 
uh, the Europeans, the Brits, the, the French, the Americans, and, and the rest of that. I know I've over-talked it, so I, I want to uh, uh, take turn it back over uh, to you, Comrade Director Uhuru. Yeah. Uhuru, Chairman. Well, I just really want to salute, you know, this incredible presentation and and just to say that, uh, you know, people in the comment section as well seem to really be taking this all in, really appreciating this profound analysis. And it can't get any clearer, you know, than this, what it is that you've just laid out. I mean, you are explained, you have explained the whole world and all of the different social forces within it and what our what our uh, overall objective has to be as African and colonized people and what the, you know, the trajectory for, you know, all uh, freedom loving peoples, you know, should be is, uh, is to deal with this whole question of the colonial mode of production. And, you know, how this, uh, how African internationalism has, <clears throat> you know, made it impossible for the colonizer to continue to, you know, use the anti-colonial struggles um, uh, happening, roiling throughout throughout the world to uh, to redefine it and um, as, a, as, a, as a point of trying to solve its own problem with their ruling class at our expense. And it's not like how they did to overthrow the nobility um, under feudalism. And you know, it was off of our backs, as you've laid out, it was off our backs that they were able to solve this, uh, this contradiction and um, now we see the same kind of things happening with the whole struggle for socialism. You know, we're saying that if you are genuinely for socialism, that you must adopt the anti-colonial struggle as your own under the leadership of the African and colonized masses of the world. It cannot happen any other way. And, you know, what you just laid out around the colonial mode of production, again, it's irrefutable. Um, so I just really want to salute uh, this presentation, this whole chapter, and especially this, uh, this section. And uh, we are gonna be taking questions uh, from the audience. We've gotten a lot of questions in so far. And for those of you ha who have not um, asked your question yet, who are still formulating those, please in enter them into the chat now. And you have some time because we're going to take a look at some announcements, what's going on in the Uhuru movement. Um, so you can uh, uh, type your question in as we go through these announcements. So the first one, join the counteroffensive to stop the FBI attacks on the African People's Socialist Party and the African liberation struggle. As we know, they have um, escalated these attacks. And so we are calling on people now to donate, volunteer to the Hands Off Uhuru, Hands Off Africa defense campaign today. Resources are urgently needed to fund the legal defense uh, uh, for you know um, our leadership. So please go to handsoffuru.org/donate. You can also go to handsoffuru.org to volunteer, sign the petition, and the emergency response pledge. And on Sundays, uh, sh uh, uh, shortly following the study at 1 p.m. Eastern, you can join an online yoga class that is a fundraiser for the Hands Off Uhuru, Hands Off Africa Defense Campaign. You can sign up by emailing yoga reparations at gmail.com and it's $10 per ticket and you can pay in advance at handsoffuhuru.org slash donate. And every Thursday at 8 p.m. Central Africa time, tune in live for the Hands Off Uhuru, Hands Off Africa, Africa region broadcast. Comrades are broadcasting in Sierra Leone, West Africa, and uh, Occupied Azania or South Africa um, every Thursday, 8 p.m. Central Africa time. And you can watch and follow on Facebook at facebook.com slash APSP Africa region. On Saturday, May 6th from 5 to 8 p.m. at Nana's Restaurant and Juice Bar in Tampa, Florida, come to the Voices of Resistance benefit concert organized by the Uhuru Solidarity Movement, raising resources for the Hands Off Uhuru, Hands Off Africa Legal Defense Fund. Several talented Florida musicians from a diverse array of genres have stepped forward to defend the democratic rights of the African community. Learn more and get your tickets at stopfbi.eventbrite. Dot com. And on Sunday, May 14th, come to Washington, D.C. for the Black Mothers March on the White House. The Black Mothers March on the White House is a coalition of Black-led organizations that have been involved in the struggle to rescue our children from the custody of the colonial state. Learn more and register at blackmothersmarch.com. We say hands off Uhuru, hands off our uh, children. And, you know, again, we know that the, the, uh, the, uh, Child Protective Services is just an iteration of the colonial state used to kidnap our babies, our African children. And it's something that has been you know, ongoing since the capture of African people ourselves. So that's May 14th, Washington, D.C., Black Mothers March. Um, 
uh, you can go to blackmothersmarch.com to register. And announcing the new book coming in June 2023 titled The Verdict is In, Reparations Now. This is the 40th anniversary edition of the report from the 1982 World Tribunal on Reparations to African People, including a foreword by Louise Kinshasa, additional testimonies, and an epilogue by Chairman Omali Eshitela. You can pre-order your copy now at theburningspear.store. And make sure you like and subscribe to The Burning Spear TV on YouTube to catch every episode of The Omali Taught Me Sunday Study. And support The Omali Taught Me Show by donating now at paypal.me slash Omali Taught Me. Uhuru Tours and Speakers Bureau is an institution of the African People's Socialist Party that coordinates events and tours for Chairman Omali Ishitela and other party speakers and leaders. So to bring electrifying presentations such as this one um, by Chairman Omali Ishitela and others, you can book the chairman um, by emailing us at info at uhurutours.com or call 727-914-3621. And for more events not listed here, you can go to theburningspear.com slash events to see everything going on in the African People's Socialist Party. And also make sure, again, to like and follow the chairman's social media pages on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and Twitch. Uh, and subscribe to the Burning Spear TV on YouTube for every episode of the Amali Taught Me Sunday Study and to see everything that's going on um, in the Uhuru movement. And just lastly, want to put a call out uh, to forces watching this today to join the African People's Socialist Party, to you know, become an African internationalist revolutionary, to defeat the colonial mode of production so that a real future can, you know, be, um, we can pave the way forward towards that real future where, you know, a reality that um, nobody has to be, you know, oppressed or living at the expense of anybody else, that Africa can have access to our own resources and to be over and control our own futures, nobody determining this for ourselves, but us. And this can only happen through the African revolution, through the freedom, the, the true freedom of African people and uh, led by the African People's Socialist Party and the theory of African internationalism. So join the African People's Socialist Party today. Go to APSPUHURU.org to fill out that contact information. And um, yeah, join the revolutionary struggle. There's no time anymore to sit on the sidelines. You see this whole thing coming undone, the struggle of the colonized um, African masses throughout the world, you know, uh, struggling to get the you know, colonial yoke off our backs. This is happening right now. History is being made right now. You have to be a part of making that history. Join the African People's Socialist Party, join the African Revolution. So that concludes our announcements for today. And I just want to appreciate everybody who is tuning in. We're going to take some questions now, and I just want to acknowledge where people are watching from. We have Largo, Florida, Oakland, California, Lakeland, Florida, St. Louis, Missouri, Marion County, Georgia, Louisville, Kentucky, Battle Creek, Michigan, Fort Myers, Florida, Wichita, Kansas, Huntsville, Alabama, the United Kingdom, Minneapolis, Minnesota, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Montreal, Canada, Frederick, Maryland, South Africa, Chicago, Illinois, Fresno, California, and Texas all tuned in with us today. So, Huru comrades, thank you for joining us. And now let's get into those questions. So, Chairman, um, our first question comes from Arthur Fields um, uh, in Fresno, California. And their question is, can Europe maintain its population and standard of life without the resources and labor from Africa? Uh, that's a good question, brother. Arthur Fields, is that it? Yes. Before going uh, to Brother Field's uh, question, I would really like to uh, salute uh, the brothers and sisters and comrades, uh, particularly uh, uh, on the continent of Africa and, and many of you in the Caribbean. I know how difficult it is uh, uh, in terms of uh, infrastructure uh, uh, development and things like that, the, how colonialism just steals so much that it's very difficult to access sometimes even electricity to be participating uh, in these studies. And I know many of you are doing group studies and things like that and having, you know, um, uh, losing uh, access to the internet uh, off and on and what have you. A special shout out uh, to, to all of you and to, uh, to my sister-in-law, uh, my dear uh, sister Afua, uh, who is there uh, in Ghana. So I wanted to uh, really appreciate that. And Arthur, you know, raise the question about Europe being able to maintain uh, even its population and the resources it have without having access to, 
to the stolen resource of Africa and other places? And of course, the, the answer is, I think, rather obvious. I, I, I go back to uh, the quote from the debate that was happening in 1907 in Stuttgart, Germany. Uh, this is a debate among uh, the most advanced uh, sectors of the European population. Uh, these are communists. <laughs> and as I mentioned earlier, there was something like 800 uh, people who attended uh, that, uh, that conference uh, in Europe. And uh, one of the arguments that was being put forward by them <laughs> had to do with resources. Where the hell are we going to get these resources uh, if uh, there is no colonialism? This is an assumption that the that they can continue to get these uh, resources, even as socialists. These are socialists you're talking about, under socialism. <laughs> they are declaring that they need these resources that comes from Africa, that comes from the colonized peoples of the world, and that they also raise the question, what are we going to do with the population that has to be exported? And there's a quote uh, in, I think Lenin uh, uses this quote uh, by uh, Cecil uh, Rhodes, uh, the murderer from England uh, who uh, took Gatling guns and things like that and stole much of what is called Southern Africa, initiated the diamond mine industry, uh, et cetera. And Lenin quotes him uh, as walking through uh, a, a section of London on one occasion and saying that people are going bread, bread and, and marching and, and, and complaining and rioting in England. And he says that it's very clear that uh, that in order uh, for us to uh, be able to prevent war and murder inside England, that we're going to have to be imperialists and we're going to have to go and get these resources from other places around the world and also have a place where we can uh, ship, uh, uh, you know, the, the surplus population. And if you remember, uh, this is uh, one of the places that, uh, that Rose went to, uh, the settler colonies. This is one of the places, I mean, you talk about what was called Rhodesia, uh, that's now called Zimbabwe, South Africa, that's now called South Africa. This is a place where the settlers in Kenya, settlers, settlers all over uh, 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 Namibia, uh, Southwest Africa, settlers uh, went uh, to these places. And of course, I'm living currently in a settler colony that's called the United States of America. So uh, you think about if the Europeans lost uh, access to all of uh, these resources, uh, then uh, that would mean uh, not only the, the, the places that were mentioned by, uh, by me just now, but like they said in Stuttgart in the debate, what would happen even to the, what they call the United States of America if the indigenous people were able to take their resources back? There's no way that what we now call Europe it could survive without the resources that they steal from the colonized people. And that's the dialectic we're talking about when we address, uh, we recognize there is a thing called a colonial mode of production. This is extremely difficult uh, for uh, uh, most uh, of colonizers who characterize themselves as socialists and communists to deal with uh, what that means in, in actual practice and terms. And they come up with various kinds of excuses well, you know, there are only X numbers of people left in this place or that place, or uh, how do we, you know, do this? And we've been here for a long time. That kind of stuff is what they are putting forward. But the truth of the matter is that, uh, that all of us who claim to be interested in making a new world have to look at the world as it is and how it got to be this way. And then we have to rectify that relationship. But the base our practice, our struggles on that. And we have a real interest in changing the world and making the world free of oppression and exploitation, that's the starting point. If we don't, if we say uh, free of uh, exploitation and oppression uh, to the point, only to the point where it makes me uncomfortable, uh, then of course uh, there is not going to be, uh, it's going to be a very difficult situation for those colonizers and people who hang out with them to be able uh, to come to the best conclusions. Uhuru. I know I, that was a lot, Arthur. <laughs> Uhuru, Chairman, and uh, thank you, uh, Arthur, for your question. And Chairman, I um, believe that question you posed it yourself, you know, in in, in books that you've written. And <laughs> the the simplest answer was no, no. <laughs> That's, <laughs> That's it. But, Uhuru, Uhuru, Chairman. I just wanted to also acknowledge this comment from uh, someone named Adriana Machado. It says solidarity from PCO Partido de Casa Operaria from Brazil um, via New York. So. Uhuru, thank you for tuning in. Is that Abiana? Adriana. Adriana, Adriana, okay. 
Um, so Uhuru, uh, just wanted to acknowledge uh, that comrade. So we have a um, uh, username, the El Sendero on YouTube, uh, ask uh, chairman, it's two questions. Um, uh, one, is it necessary to end patriarchy to truly bring the colonial mode of production to an end? Ultimately, doesn't the superstructure rest on a foundation of patriarchy? Um, and we, we might be able to come back to this second question. Um, says, not to divert, I mean just as an aside, after the discussion on the colonial mode of production, it will be interesting to get the chairman's thoughts and insights on the situation in Sudan. So, Uhuru. I just want to say in terms of patriarchy, I mean, there are, there are various uh, ways that uh, the colonial mode of production expresses itself and uh, uh, that uh, patriarchy relies on the colonial mode of production and not the other way around uh, any more than uh, as the argument used to go about uh, fascism and, and all of these other uh, entities, all these other symptoms of the colonial mode of production. There cannot be an appropriate development without the assault uh, being made primarily on the colonial mode of production. What we say is that uh, the fundamental contradiction in the whole world uh, revolves around uh, the oppression of nations by nations. And uh, uh, the, the, the fact is that uh, there are oppressor nation and there are oppressed nations of people and that there are contradictions uh, existing among uh, the oppressed people and contradictions that exist among the oppressor people. And that uh, the, the fundamental contradiction, the main contradiction, this is not to say that there are not a whole bunch of contradictions. That's why this whole nonsense about intersectionality, et cetera, that's where it comes from in part because it, if they're forced now to recognize that there are a bunch of contradictions, but there's a way that there's an attempt being made all the time uh, to liquidate or obscure the fundamental contradiction, the main contradiction that holds the whole thing together. And that is the colonial mode of production. That is the oppression of nations by nations. <clears throat> and so it's not to say that other uh, contradictions do not exist. I mean, uh, you know, even, uh, you know, we recognize that among African in Africa, there's this contradiction too. Uh, oppression of women, uh, the exploitation of working people, the oppression of homosexuals and things like that. Uh, but uh, just, as they're, uh, they're just as that exists among the oppressor nations. But what we're saying is that all of those things require as a condition of existence, the oppression of nations by nations. It would not even be possible to have that discussion uh, if this fundamental, profoundly significant contradiction did not exist. So that's what we're saying. And many, much of what we characterize as contradictions are things that are born of, uh, born of uh, the, 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 the uh, colonial mode of production, the oppression of peoples, of nations, uh, of, of, uh, uh, by nations, et cetera. So uh, that's my response to that, uh, con, uh, Comrade Sendero, I think. Um, Again, it's not to dismiss or liquidate it. You know, there are all kinds of contradictions. Um, uh, and uh, there's, there's a contradiction that presupposes a biological, uh, you know, basis uh, that, that uh, being primary. And some people do uh, experience uh, contradictions in, in a particular way based on, on gender, uh, based on uh, sexuality, sexual preferences, and also... If you look at the whole question of patriarchy and its origin, you don't find patriarchy. Uh, uh, patriarchy is something that more or less, and I say this more or less, introduced uh, into uh, the uh, the overall uh, superstructure uh, born out of uh, out of uh, European uh, colonial domination of the rest of us. Of her chairman. And again, that was um, Comrade D.L. Sendero. 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 Spell Sendero for me, please. S E N D E R O. Okay, okay. okay. Mm. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, so we're going to go to the next question. And we'll, um, we probably towards the end, chairman, we might be able to go back to the, the question on Sudan if you have any thoughts about what's going on there. Um, but this next question comes from uh, Namdi X on, um, I believe, YouTube, username Namdi X. says, how does African internationalism relate to other ideologies like Pan-Africanism and socialism? And also, do they work together simultaneously? And it's a two-part question. What are some of the challenges facing the implementation of African internationalism in contemporary African politics? 
I'm not quite sure uh, what that last section meant. Some of the challenges I think of implementing uh, uh, African internationalism is the is the I guess the answer to that is the existing uh, colonial state apparatus that's attacks and and puts people in prison uh, for trying to challenge the existing uh, colonial uh, status quo. That's the fundamental thing. And I think it's really important for us to understand, uh, as some do not, uh, that African African people have agency. There are people who stand outside of Africa and then claim hands off uh, 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 AFRICOM, out of Africa, et cetera. And AFRICOM, of course, as we know, is a military intervention that's a comprehensive uh, military intervention uh, by, uh, by the United States in particular uh, uh, in Africa. And this intervention by the United States is comprehensive. It, it's in contention with other forces. Everybody who, all of the other colonial powers uh, uh, and, uh, and some of the non-traditional uh, powers uh, who contest and contend with the uh, European and United States domination of Africa find themselves uh, 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 on the, in the crosshairs of the, this, uh, this, this, uh, um, uh, what do they call it? AFRICOM, uh, Africa Command. So that that's there. But the thing is, and we say <laughs> we say AFRICOM out of Africa, down with AFRICOM, that kind of thing. But uh, but we can't say it from the outside. Now, the African Socialist International gives us the ability, and this is back to the whole question of how how we implement African internationalism. Uh, we implement African internationalism by creating African internationalists, and African internationalists are forces who. Uh, 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 active, they combine the, and unite with the theory of practice and and uh, the unity of theory and practice. We go to work. Uh, we are actively engaged uh, uh, in Africa, in the Caribbean, in the United States, in Europe, etc. Uh, and we won, and we increasingly move to win uh, Africans to uh, this revolutionary organization, revolutionary consciousness, and things like that. So we implement it uh, by organizing. Uh, 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 African people uh, as our own liberators, connected, uh, united, uh, common ideological framework and what have you, uh, and, and, and becoming professional revolutionaries who among, in, in addition to whatever else we may be and other things that we may do, our profession is revolution, overturn this relationship that we have to colonial domination of African, African people and the peoples of the world. So uh, I hope that moved us toward understanding uh, Comet Nomni uh, X, at least uh, what, what our position on that question is, that, that for Africa to be free, Africans are gonna, ha we're gonna have to recognize that Africa and African people have agency. We're not just somebody who are there saying, hands off this, hands off that. We are somebody who chopping off hands. Uh, that's on us. We are there to be engaged uh, in struggling and to liberate ourselves. Uh, that's. That's that's essentially what uh, I would say about that. And I want to thank you, Carmen Namne, for posing the question. Uhuru. Uhuru, yes, thank you, uh, Comrade Namdi. He says, thank you, Chairman Amalia Shatella. Um, <clears throat> and also want to acknowledge we got a donation in uh, from Comrade Janaba on YouTube. Thank you so much for donating to our broadcast this morning. Um, and our, uh, well, one of the next questions, Chairman, is actually something that um, was posed for last week's study when we were uh, looking at the um, African revolution of IET. And I think it's relevant though to today's discussion. Um, and this comes from comrade Diop. The question was, Uhuru, did Cuba seize control of the means of production concretely? How does such an effort look? And um, like I said, I think it's relate, it relates to this because we you know, talk about how um, the struggle for socialism and, you know, its implementation has yet to, you know, really be achieved uh, because of this, um, you know, around this question of the, the colonial mode of production. So, Uhuru. Uh, I'm, I'm not quite, the question was, if, what was it? Um, uh, did Cuba seize control of the, of the means of production concretely? How does such an effort look? Were those two sentences? Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, did Cuba seize the means of production? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, more or less as they existed. But you know, Cuba is a small island, and uh, but yes, it it seized the means of production as as they exist and as they had developed in Cuba, and uh, the success of the Cuban Revolution with the limited resources that's there, uh, with the fact that they've been isolated uh, in a very serious way uh, from the world economy. Uh, which is a capitalist world economy, though shakily so right now, 
uh, it shows what the people can do. Uh, and just like Black Power Blueprint, the work that we do uh, in the United States, in St. Petersburg, Florida, in Huntsville, Alabama, in, in uh, 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 St. Louis, Missouri, the, the pro projects that we've initiated, 50 some odd uh, 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 economic and, 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 and Black Power institutions uh, uh, that we have initiated uh, on our own. It gives us uh, uh, a signal of what our possibilities are. Uh, uh, if we have control of our own resources. And, you know, we live uh, in places that Cuba is a part of the whole world economy. Uh, Cuba has been bled, uh, African enslavement there. Uh, Cuba has been bled for such a long period of time. And look at what Cuba has produced. I'm talking about now that Cuba has the best, one of the best healthcare systems in the world. Uh, they, they export uh, thousands of doctors uh, to oppressed communities and they'd be in, they'd be uh, right now in St. Louis and they'd be in Philadelphia where they're much needed if it were not for the embargo that's been imposed on them. So the objective is to keep Cuba starved and to keep uh, to, that's why banks have uh, sanctioned the programs that we are doing in this, in this country. So the objective is to make that impossible to occur. And uh, we see well, what it could look like just by what Cuba has done already, uh, with, with notwithstanding uh, the, uh, the, the imposition of these draconian and uh, horrible uh, uh, economic and uh, bargos that's there. And we see uh, well, what we've done right here in this country. We see by what Garvey was able to do in 1920 with steamship lines and things like that. That shows us what what the possibilities are. And that also shows us why there's every effort being made to crush it, to put it down. Cuba's a small island. Uh, St. Louis is a very relatively small city. St. Petersburg, Florida, small cities. But uh, the fact is that they represent the potential uh, for the oppressed. Uh, and it gives evidence of what the press could accomplish if they, were, uh, if they didn't exist. And the thing about that that's so important is it also exposes the parasitic nature of the colonial mode of production. It is a mode of production that requires sucking the blood, sucking the resource out of the colonizers in order for the colonizers to be successful. And so you have Cuba 90 miles away from Miami or from Key West, certainly from Florida, uh, on the one hand, uh, that's uh, having a, a difficult time uh, just uh, feeding and clothing themselves uh, based on the embargo, being separated from the resources that they've created over, over a, a century. Uh, uh, more, uh, uh, and, and uh, then you have a wealthy uh, 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 population in Miami, uh, a, a colonizer population. That's not to count the people who are living under bridges and tents and stuff like that and standing in front of, uh, of these, uh, uh, these little uh, stores with styrofoam cups begging uh, uh, you know, to, for some funds to eat and feed their children, et cetera. But you see what the possibilities are. And you see this dialectical relationship. You see in St. Louis, they have what they, there is existing, what is called the Del Mar Divide. Uh, south of the Del Mar, uh, which is where uh, most of the white people live, you've got great living conditions, circumstances. I mean, uh, sidewalk cafes and the whole rest of that. And then uh, uh, in North St. Louis, the majority of the Africans live, you've got nothing but poverty. Uh, desolate uh, communities, except for the things that we have initiated in the African People's Socialist Party and how that's helping to change uh, the, the, how North St. Louis look. Look at St. Petersburg, Florida. I was talking to comrades not too long ago how remarkable it is uh, when you go to St. Petersburg, Florida, and you're downtown Central Avenue, the place where you, comrade Akile, uh, in 2017, 2019, running for a local office there, marching down the streets. It's a place where only... Uh, something like 20% of the population is African, 80% more or less white people. Uh, and they, they, and here you are marching down, you know, uh, even have a couple of hundred white people following you going to unity through reparations on the one hand. But anybody who's ever seen the Battle of uh, Algiers, that movie, that's what was struck me the last time I was in St. Petersburg, Florida. You have all these rich, wealthy white people, you know, I mean, with sidewalk cafes, the whole, abundance. And I hear them referring often to St. Petersburg as paradise. And then all you have to do is cross central, going south, and uh, look at the conditions of African people. It reminds me so much of the Casbah, uh, where Africans, Algerians live as compared to that Algeria uh, that the French colonizers lived in. It's just extraordinary. And so you have wealth going to one sector of the world, uh, coming and being sucked uh, from another sector of the world, and you have uh, wealth uh, in St. Louis coming from one sector of the population, 
uh, 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 coming at the expense of the resources and life of, uh, of people who are north of the Del Mar Divide. So that's the kind of relationship that we're looking at. And that's why there's this whole uh, real effort being made constantly uh, to deny, first of all, agency to Africa and the African people. We cannot be in charge of our own affairs. We, we, uh, we have to, for example, in St. Louis, uh, uh, there is a, a extreme poverty, just the most brutal kind of poverty you can see in a place in North St. Louis. Uh, but that doesn't mean that everybody has a star because they would put up trucks and things like that. And, and they would bring uh, 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 foods and bananas and fruits and uh, et cetera, that they would put out on the sidewalks close to churches. Uh, and they would give people this stuff that you can eat. So it's not that they want you to star. It's just that they don't want you to be able to feed, clothe, and house yourselves. And so there's always United Nations. There are always these other entities that's there. And of course, what they do is they serve as a kind of pressure relief valves uh, so that you can get something to eat and you won't try to make a revolution, you won't try to overturn anything. And in fact, you become quite beholden uh, 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 to colonizers because they're really nice people who bring you food when you're starving. Uh, but they also are the colonizers who will deny us the ability to feed, clothe, and house ourselves. And this is the essence of the colonial mode of production that we are talking about now. So uh, was that Diop? I appreciated the comment, Diop. It was good to see you uh, here uh, uh, at the at the market here in Philadelphia, um, and that's one of the economic uh, development projects that we have created with the party. Incredible market. People should come out to it. Uhuru. Uhuru. People do. Come out to it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Uhuru. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Comrade Diop. And I just wanted to uh, say a little shameless plug here. Uh, if you are in the St. Pete, Tampa Bay area today at 4 p.m., we're going to be doing a film showing of the Battle of Algiers um, uh, today at uh, the Uhuru House, 1245 18th Avenue South. Again, that's 4 p.m. And I just wanted to just say to that, um, uh, Chairman, I I learned that um, you know what their objective was in terms of the French, uh, the colonizer, was to turn Algeria, Al, you know, Al, Algeria into the second Paris. Yeah. And so after they create the first Paris from yeah. colonizing and stealing Africa's yeah. resources, then they go to uh, into Africa to make a second Paris for the colonizer. So, um, well, you think about this. You 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 mentioned that, for example, uh, there was a thing called New Amsterdam. You know what New Amsterdam was? <laughs> You know where Amsterdam, the old Amsterdam is? Mm -hmm. That's in Holland, right? right? New Amsterdam was New York. Oh. Uh, so the thing is that the exportation of colonialism is something that Europe did. It, it exported it all around the world. And, you know, so you have a Philippines named from a white man named Philip, uh, who had prince and then King Philip of Spain, you know, et cetera. This is the kind of stuff that we contend with. And that's why we get these crazy, uh, these these last names, these insulting names that's imposed on us by the colonizers, you know? Uh, and that's why in the United States, I'm, I make this point, uh, you know, rather frequently in the United States, uh, you have uh, what's called African-American now, that's the nicest thing that we've been known as. You have, uh, you have things like uh, 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 Mexican-Americans and, Chinese Americans even, and uh, et cetera, but you don't have any French Americans. You don't have any German Americans. Uh, you don't have any Dutch Americans. Uh, the fact is that the only place that hyphen exists <coughs> is with Africans and colonized people mostly. That distinguishes us as a subject and colonized people, and it also makes the point uh, that America is white. It's a white country. It's a colonizer country. They stole its resources, and it was not intended uh, for us, uh, for the indigenous people. You have the so-called American Indians. <clears throat> we become hyphenated extensions of Europe and, and uh, uh, et cetera. <clears throat> so, yeah, there's a New Amsterdam. There's a, all of these characterizations that they, they make, you know, of us. <clears throat> yeah. Uhuru, Uhuru Chairman. But we have agency. That's that's why I'm I'm no longer Joseph Waller. We have agency. Right. You know, we name ourselves. You know, we define and shape the world that as we want it to be. We don't have to accept the world as it has been imposed on us by these oppressors. Uhuru. Yes. Uhuru, Uhuru Chairman. 
absolutely really want to appreciate uh, just this whole study and the questions um, that have come in from viewers like you. I really want to appreciate, um, you know, the discussion that's happening right now. I want to acknowledge. So D.L. Sendero is uh, Comrade Paul Caritas. Um, and uh, Paul also donated $20 to today's broadcast. So Huru, uh, thank you, uh, Paul, and says, thank you, Chairman, for a very instructive session. Um, we also uh, got a question uh, from username LinkX16 regarding the escalated attacks um, on our movement by the US government, um, the FBI. And I just want to say to this, this question of how you can support right now, go to handsoffuhuru.org slash donate fund, you know, uh, put resources into the legal defense fund. This is what we're calling on people at this moment to do. Donate, donate, donate. Tell your friends and family to donate. Uh, the chairman says, uh, let your dollars do the marching, the demonstrating for you. Donate to handsoffroot.org um, uh, slash donate uh, to, to fund the legal defense uh, for this whole campaign in the counteroffensive. Um, <clears throat> I want to stay in relationship to that, Comrade Akile that our objective now, as it has always been, is to, uh, to uh, actually recapture our Africa for African people ourselves. To re the, Africa is the birthright of every living black person on the planet Earth. Uh, our objective is to create uh, these uh, institutions that we call it dual and contending power by black people wherever we exist not just the power to exist side by side with colonial power, but uh, contend uh, with the colonizer. This is, uh, this is really critical uh, as a part of the struggle that people have to get accustomed to the notion of this. Uh, I've seen some questions uh, in uh, the comment section uh, uh, making suggestions about what it might be that we wanna do. What we wanna do is win African people, the majority of African people to this understanding position that we have to be independent and free. And then uh, we understand that colonialism uh, requires uh, 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 an abject supine uh, population who can be bled to death, our resources sucked from us. And so part of the struggle, the most critical, the most significant aspect of the struggle is to win African people to the understanding of being politically and economically independent from colonialism. And then to be able to actualize that by creating a, another power, even as we oppress, we begin to create our own power that contends with the colonial power. That's what it is that we're doing. And ultimately what that means is that we have to have power to govern ourselves, feed, cold, house, and govern ourselves. That's the strategic trajectory that we are on. And we're on that strategic trajectory that tells us the other kinds of things that we need to do at any given moment. And it also informs us of when they need to be done. So uh, Uhuru. Uhuru Chairman, um, thank you. And I wanna just read this comment from a uh, username Red Horizon says, quote, liberation is not achieved by a country merely proclaiming independence or winning a revolution. It is achieved when imperialist economic domination over the people is brought to an end. That's Che Guevara. Yeah. So Uhuru. Uhuru. Che said it better yeah. than anybody. Yeah. Uhuru, Uhuru Chairman. And, um, you know, I wanted to, to, to bring this up because, um, you know, as we're studying this, it just reminded me of the study we did last week on the African Revolution of IET or Haiti and, um, and how the, the African Revolution, you know, through that process had developed its own constitution. And it had, um, we talked about this a little bit about the, the whole question of national suicide, how uh, white people who, the colonizer who joined in the struggle uh, of the African Revolution, you know, became, you know, black, uh, black. <laughs> you know, became black. And, you know, how this just uh, perfectly goes into, I think, this discussion around the road to socialism, you know, being painted black and how, you know, uh, this this question of uh, socialism cannot be achieved in any real genuine sense, you know, on the backs of, of, of uh, African people on the pedestal of colonialism. Um, so I just wanted to make that uh, connection. <clears throat> Thank you. I also want to say I saw somebody made a comment about uh, how the the desolate uh, communities uh, and how Detroit uh, uh, was one uh, such uh, city, and uh, that was characterized as paradise. And Detroit was an incredibly significant uh, base of uh, African resistance and struggle. And uh, the, the workers, uh, African consciousness, the worker, workers there had built just amazing uh, movements. And Detroit has paid the price for that. 
in terms of the uh, exp- pushing Africans out of there uh, and 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 the destruction of even much of the uh, uh, the economic infrastructure uh, there and and uh, uh, there are, there are stories that can be told about the movement in Detroit and people should study that people should really look at when black people had an, uh, uh, some uh, element of political power. Uh, in Detroit. And of course, you have this heavy concentration of African people there. So uh, anyway, I just uh, uh, wanted to to mention that. Uhuru. Uhuru, Chairman. And Uhuru, comrades, keep your questions coming. I just wanted to read some uh, of the comments here, uh, just based on so many different things that you said up to now, Chairman. Um, Somebody says, uh, Comrade Robert, um, says Asante Sana, Chairman Amali, and Director Kile for this deep political study watching from Collegeville, Pennsylvania, Guru. Um, uh, a user named Lima Beam says, when the French came, they literally bulldozed Algiers over to rebuild it and pretend our ancestors had nothing, which they robbed and still hold to this day. And I mean, that's the that's the thing we hear, you know, today, and even what we saw with the 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 this communist international, I mean, the savages, and they have no civilization, and you know, it, it sounded like the white man's burden, <laughs> you know, among these forces. Well, you know, people like to hold up, especially communists of all all persuasions and nationalities, like the, the, the success of the uh, Paris, the commune, and as the example of the workers coming to power, had this great, you know, struggle there in Paris. And uh, it was finally crushed uh, uh, by the, the, the French uh, government, but many, and they killed a lot of people in Paris. And, but many of, uh, of, of the survivors uh, were sent uh, to prisons uh, in, uh, uh, in places uh, in the, the some island Pacific uh, region. I'm trying to remember uh, particularly, somebody's going to remember and put it in the comments section. And, and, and they, the survivors uh, of, over a period of time, took over the territories from indigenous black people who were there. So you have, uh, you know, these forces who were heroic and, 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 and uh, represent iconic heroic uh, 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 memories of communist achievement and, and actually became the template for what that should look like, the Paris Commune on the one hand. On the other hand, when they, the commune was crushed, I mean, they were uh, uh, deported to French colonial territories uh, in the Pacific. Uh, they actually took it over over a period of time. Now they're the majority. They control uh, that at the expense of the African people, of black people who were there before. Uh, this is what we're looking at. I'm, I'm talking now history. I'm talking about having to have a materialist understanding, recognition of the significance of the colonial mode of production, colonialism, and how... Uh, we've seen people, white people, fight for socialism, fight for rights, et cetera, and they end up being white rights at the expense of the colonized peoples of the world. That's the reality that we're dealing with, and this is not uh, trying to make pejorative statements about white people and the colonizers. It's just to say that we have to come to a scientific, objectively attained understanding of the world and how it got to be this way. And we have to remain, remove these shackles, these ideological shackles, uh, that around whiteness, et cetera, from being able uh, to get to uh, to the truth. Yes, Uhuru Chairman. I mean, it's just so important. And I think, uh, you know, what you've been saying about how African internationalism, this analysis, it reintroduces Africa and African people into history and how, you know, colonial mode of production has wiped, you know, Africa, you know, out of history and how this whole revolutionary struggle that we're involved in is thrusting us back in part of defining the world as it actually is and not from the position of the colonizer, how the colonizer perceives itself, including the so-called socialists and communist colonizers, you know, who would, uh, you know, who can take this position based on their position as the colonizer. Um, so I just really, really appreciate this. And um, there we have a question here. Let I, me I, say this, comment, uh, because uh, the fact is that you don't even hear the communists and all these other people, and even black nationalists, most people refer uh, to the indigenous people here unless they're in the room. Uh, unless somebody say, well, they're coming to get their resources, their land, or something to that effect. But you're talking about how uh, the colonial mode of production helps to disappear uh, those uh, whose resources to get stolen from them, Africans, 
the other colonized peoples, you know, uh, that's what happens in the, in the United States, you know, the indigenous people. I mean, uh, even uh, when you look at uh, this talk about, you know, the wall, they've, so much was said about Trump and you talk about the borders, uh, et cetera. Uh, you know, you got walls all over Palestine. You got walls uh, here uh, separating the indigenous people from the land, their resources and things like that. That's the reality that we live with and that you cannot come uh, to some conclusion about changing the world by overturning a social system without looking at its foundation. And how can you get to the foundation? You don't even recognize half of Mexico was stolen. By 1848, they consolidated that. You know, uh, and then before they stole Mexico, how, you know, you got this thing that they call the Louisiana Purchase, that 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 the uh, African Revolution made necessary, uh, that French had to, France had to give up uh, these resources. That's on about a third of what now the territory of the United States, if not more. Uh, you can't get to an understanding of any of this uh, uh, unless you uh, look at that entire history of how it got to be the way it is. You know how it got to be the way it is, you know what it takes to deconstruct this process and, and free the peoples of the world. Uhuru. Right, Uhuru Chairman. I mean, and, and even to say the U.S. is a settler colony, I think that's really profound in terms of, it's something that never went away, it still exists. And indigenous people, like you said, you know, not even mentioned unless they're in the room, but right now living, you know, on these uh, concentration camps referred to as uh, reservations and, you know, have something like a, a life expectancy, something like in the 40s. And, you know, like this is this is real. This, this is, is colonialism. Yeah. 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 And the anti-capitalists um, never seem to find their way to the reservation, as they call it, you know, or the right. housing projects for that matter. You won't find right. them in the housing projects, et cetera. Right. You know? uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh, chairman. Um, we had uh, another question come in and I just want to, you know, this, this context wasn't provided in this uh, question specifically, but I just wanted to add uh, these things in because yesterday this thing, um, it's a, uh, characterizes Earth Day. And, um, you know, and I just, uh, in terms of the colonial mode of production as its relationship to the entire planet, I mean, African internationalism has summed this up. The real environmentalists are anti-colonialists. That's it. And, um, you know, so you got people who characterize themselves as environmentalists, but won't touch the colonial question. And um, so this question came in from uh, Stephen Worth and asks, uh, how do we solve the contradiction of commodifying uh, non-human animals um, and so I just, you know, wanted to to throw that in the mix as well. Well, so. you know, I mean, the commodification of a commodity, by the way, is uh, anything that's uh, more or less produced for, uh, for sale. Uh, and it's a definition of how capitalism has come to represent itself, born out of the colonial mode of production. Uh, uh, um, nothing is uh, done or, uh, or and, and very little exists. Uh, within this uh, mode of production that's not for the purpose of a uh, sale. Everything's for sale, you know. Uh, that's why, uh, you know, I mean, uh, Lenin once said that the capitalist will sell you the rope to hang him with. Uh, uh, that's a statement about, you know, uh, uh, what this whole system is. And the statement about why you don't have to worry too much about Titanic's, you know, sinking because the icebergs are melting away, you know, uh, as a consequence of the assault on the environment by this process of selling everything. And uh, so, you know, uh, to talk about the commodification of animals, et cetera, anything under this social system uh, 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 that is produced uh, uh, more or less is, uh, becomes a commodity. That's what a commodity is, something that's produced uh, for sale, for, for uh, as they, they, uh, they like to refer it, for the market. So, you know, I don't know where to take that beyond that uh, uh, comment, Stephen. That's, that's, that's what it is about. Oh, really? Somebody mentioned finally got the news uh, yeah. about the League of Revolutionary Black Workers uh, out of Detroit. Uh, amazing uh, kind of a struggle that happened there. And I knew, um, you know, several of the forces who played important roles uh, there. Uhuru. Uhuru, Uhuru Chairman. Um, also, thank you, Stephen, uh, for your question. And, um, you know, I just think just to add to that, Chairman, and you make the point clear that the first commodity for sale uh, was African people ourselves. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, um, you know, everything after that's a parasitic, you know, uh, relationship and it bleeds, you know, the resources of a whole people and the whole planet. Um, and it has no regard for life, has no regard, you know, for um, uh, the planet's, you know, survival itself. And, you know, in fact, it's so interesting that there would be an Earth Day. It's kind of like how they kill our leaders, <laughs> you know, assassinate our leaders and then give you a day. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they kill the planet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Somebody posted something I saw recently. Uh, there was something that was posted. I think it was uh, uh, Comrade Sister Betty Davis out of New York. And she says that uh, this was a sign that somebody had uh, uh, someplace in New York. And it says, uh, black people used to live here. Mm. <laughs> and yes. uh, there used to be indigenous people here. There used to be animals here. There used to be all of these things here before we met this guy. Yeah. You know, that guy, you know, who came uh, as the colonizer. Yeah. Oh, for real. New camera. Caledonia. Mm -hmm. That's what Lima Bean has uh, that we're talking about. New Caledonia. That's where, you know, subsequent to uh, the uh, so-called Paris uh, Commune uh, and those who survived it uh, uh, were sent to New Caledonia, where they now become uh, the uh, dominant force and at the expense and really bad treatment of the indigenous people there. This is Lima Bean who made that uh, statement. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, and Lima Bean's making other great uh, statements yeah. as well. Uh, said also, yes, without the human resources of Africa, they basically ain't got nothing, nothing. or they can't do nothing. nothing. And here's why they continue to export our people, our greatest assets via brain drain and use uh, um, use others as their mercenaries. Um, so that was- should be remembered just based on what uh, <clears throat> from Lima Bean has said that Part of the attack on Africa in terms of the uh, uh, theft of human beings was also an assault on African technology uh, that they stole and utilized. I'm not just talking about the technology that they stole in Africa, but I mean brought African here uh, who had certain uh, kinds of expertise. There are certain places where we grew rice and knew how to grow rice better than anybody and other kinds of things like that. So it's important because... You know, we get this uh, picture of the of the the ignorant mammy and you know what have you who was brought here and didn't know anything until the white man rescued us from a state of barbarism, as was talked about here with the 1907 Stuttgart uh, Common Sense International meeting, uh, which is absolutely nonsense. You know, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, the whole colonial mode of production it stopped real human progress that's that's what we saw you know yeah. the interruption of human progress in yeah. history was what the colonial mode of production has done um <clears throat> and uh i just want to read is there another i thought there was another comment but um i'm going to take this last question chairman because we're getting to that uh, uh point where we're almost out of time uh this comes from comrade mandisi uh, says, can Chairman expand some more on why spreading African internationalism is not just preaching or trying to uh, get a message out, but to bring the masses together? And how will we achieve strength in numbers? Let me say this. Uh, when you talk about theory, uh, and, and Marx was right. He says theory, when it grasps the masses, becomes a material force. And uh, our responsibility is, uh, first of all, uh, to win the advanced sectors of the African population, uh, to African internationalism, to organization, to, to assume the responsibility of organizing masses of our people. So it's not necessarily true. It's, uh, it's a fact, absolutely, that people won't come to some great theoretical understandings automatically. Those, that's what we do. Somebody accused us of, of training some reactionary uh, 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 Negro uh, who worked for the government, uh, a provocateur, and that was thrown into our organization and said, well, you train them. Uh, we train everybody who comes into our organization. We train uh, people. We bring theory to people. And that's what informs uh, us. We, we, the advanced sector to go out among the masses of the people and provide the political education and organization that brings them into political life. So that's the key thing that we're talking about. Uh, so that's where the theory comes from, the theory comes from the Revolutionary Party. The African People's Socialist Party is not the working class. We are the advanced detachment of the working class. We are that sector of the working class that shows the way forward. We go and organize among the working class to elevate their consciousness and provide direction 
and to show the line of march at any given time. That's that's who we are, uh, which is why they have succeeded at different times uh, in destroying movements uh, uh, because uh, we have not succeeded uh, in doing the thing that I'm talking about now. So that's who the African People's Socialist Party is. So the masses of the people won't automatically get it. We 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 have we we have people who commit uh, to becoming revolutionaries, to, who commit uh, to uh, taking on this responsibility of being professional revolutionary. This is what my life is dedicated to. No matter whatever else I may be doing, I am committed as a revolutionary to make this revolution. That means I go and work among the masses of the people to take the science. And it won't always come directly as some lecture, as uh, has been mentioned. It comes in the form of economic development programs that bring the masses of the people into it. It comes in the process of seeing murder and mayhem being committed against our people and intervening in those struggles to help bring people to a better understanding as they respond to the murder and mayhem that they do understand, that they do see why it's happening, why in that particular contradiction there is a universal contradiction uh, that we can bring the people to. That's the responsibility of those of us who constitute the advanced detachment. I see people who are commenting uh, in, this, in this discussion right now who are those kinds of people uh, who can take this theory and who can put the theory in the language that the people understand, that the people are familiar with. And I'm not talking about pandering to the people. I'm talking about elevating that uh, because I've seen in a very short pe period of time, you have people in El Salvador who, who were peasants one day uh, and didn't have any kind of education in six months or less than that. Uh, you find that them uh, providing, they understand imperialism, capitalism, colonialism, and things like that. People said they couldn't understand. We have had the experience in the African People's Socialist Party uh, where uh, 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 and Jomo that preceded the African People's Socialist Party, where we brought young people into our movement. And these are some of them have been people that the educational institutions have declared that they were they were uh, uneducable. They couldn't be taught. And the next thing they know, they see these people are putting out newsletters and they're quoting Che Guevara and they're they're quoting revolutionary struggles and they are uh, summing up for masses of the people. That's our responsibility. Take it to the people and then, and then help the people to uh, uh, come to uh, some understanding of reality and the basis of that. You'll see great leaps being made by people in terms of their consciousness, their development, and especially when, they, when we get involved them in changing the world. When the people get involved in changing the world, the people change themselves. That's why people make huge errors when they assume that they're so smart, they just go and talk at the people and not bring the people into the process of changing the world. This is how we do that. And so the response to that is uh, that we are an organization. We create various kinds of mass organizations that concentrate on particular issues that masses can, can grapple with, that masses are grappling with all the time. Nobody's sitting around uh, uh, trying to solve their problem, talking about dialectical materialism, African internationalism, et cetera. We do that. We, as the advanced attachment, we help people to come to that conclusion. Uh, but the thing is, people are trying to solve their problems in light. And it's the responsibility of the Revolutionary Party to intervene in life that people are struggling with and trying to, uh, and, and trying through, through which they're trying to maneuver uh, under the colonial domination. Uh, anyway, that's part of what I would say. And uh, that's part of what I would say in response to that comment, Mandisi. Uhuru, Uhuru Chairman. And I mean, there is no better example of, of that in terms of practice. So not just, you know, a theory, but something we put in motion in the world. And um, the African People's Socialist Party, all of the, the organizations, the over 50 economic institutions, you know, all of these things that are, you know, constantly engaging and bringing people in and and dealing with, you know, like questions that people are directly confronted with. And as, you know, as an opening to be able to bring people to these conclusions, to be able to explain, you know, why our conditions are the way it is, uh, why, you know, uh, it takes um, uh, Afri enough uh, babies to die in childbirth in St. Louis to fill 15 kin kindergarten classrooms. Well, this is how, you know, the party, the Uhuru movement has, you know, responded to this question. And even, you know, we mentioned the Black Mothers March, you know, how, uh, CPS, this uh, colonial state apparatus, always present in our lives, stealing our babies. How do we deal with this? We have, you know, this program, so on and so forth. So, well, they, they like to brag about being uh, about rule uh, by law in this country. The fact is that they've been stealing our babies from the very inception. That's how we got here through baby theft and what have you. Mm -hmm. And so, what ha what happens is, okay, they say, okay, it's now 
illegal to enslave black people under these terms. They create a new law because the resistance of the black people won't tolerate doing the same way. So they say slavery is illegal now, except that's the 13th Amendment, except mm -hmm. when it's punishment for a crime. Uh, uh, that, that now it's illegal to steal black people's babies now, except when the mothers and the community is so rotten and foul that they won't take care of them. Then we steal them for their own benefit. This is the, this is the line of the oppressor. So they are helping us. They, they, they are talking about how they're doing this for us. And, and this is the garbage they put out to the world. And sometimes people who are victimized by this uh, are ashamed to even say the baby got stolen. It's been difficult to get organization around that because of that. And, and they are tainted in our own communities because the colonizer, the enslaver said that you are enslaving, you are oppressor, you are the colonizer, et cetera. So anyway, I've, I've intervened and, and interrupted you the last time, comrade, because we don't have much time left anyway for the hood. For Chairman, no, this is this is really. This thing about baby theft, though, it's, it's yes. yeah, yeah, I'm um, yeah, and um, African internationalism, though, it explains all of that and it traces it back, has an origin that this stuff didn't just emerge. Um, you know, because they like to say, well, the system is broken. No, the system is <laughs> this whole thing of colonial mode of production. It works. So, exactly. So uh, the life of a white baby, um, you know, comes as a consequence of, you know, the, the theft or the death of an African baby. Yeah. So that's the colonial mode of production. That's the relationship that you are, you know, um, talking about that, you know, we must come to terms with. And everything we've discussed up to now has been to expose and, and to show this relationship, how this thing works. Um, and, you know, we've talked about Algiers, we've talked about Haiti, we've talked about right here, the settler colony of the US, we've talked about Palestine, all these things, these examples out there in the world that reinforce your analysis around the colonial mode of production. So I really want to salute just your leadership, the theory of African internationalism, and you know how it's gone to really transform the world. Um, like you said, there is no putting this genie back in the bottle. So uh, Chairman, we are at that point in time now. Um, you provided so many great uh, uh, statements and interventions up to now, but um, in these last couple minutes, uh, do you just wanna provide us with uh, some closing remarks? I just wanna thank everybody for being here and uh, call on you uh, to share as much as you can about what it is that we've talked about, what we continue to talk about. I think this is incredibly significant for us. This is uh, uh, the genie that cannot be put back in the bottle. We've discovered uh, some things that we have to share, uh, share, share uh, with our people. Uh, we have to break out of this, uh, uh, this information encirclement that's uh, been created by forces like uh, Zuckerberg and Facebook and all of those other entities that we and now having to use. Uh, Malcolm X once said that a white man cannot win another war on the ground. That is true. Uh, that they're powerful from the air, from uh, a distance, et cetera, with bombs and missiles. And also uh, they are powerful in cyberspace. Uh, the reality is that we got to be on the ground. We got to organize among the masses of people, bring people into political education, political organization. That's the way forward. Thank you very, very, very much, comrades. Uh, I salute you. And I just want to say, ease, we're late to Africa. Africa is our land. We will be free. Uhuru. Uhuru. And uh, to that, I want to say hands off Uhuru, hands off Africa. Uh, really want to appreciate and salute, you know, this brilliant presentation, Chairman, and your leadership. And also all of you for tuning in to the Amali Taught Me uh, show. And also to our show team to help pull all of this uh, together together just want to salute you all as well. Make sure to follow the chairman on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Twitch, and subscribe to the Burning Spirit TV on YouTube to catch every episode of the Amali Taught Me Sunday Study. Uhuru, comrades. Vanguard up. Relentless. Uhuru.